begin today with reading a couple of verses, one from Galatians chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, I'd like to invite you to, to uh, turn to these wonderful passages. Galatians chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. Grace be to you, and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who, has, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God our, and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. And another one, Ephesians, a little bit to the right. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Ephesians 1, verses 1 to 4. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with how many? All spiritual blessings in heaven places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. What an, what an inviting passage or passages this is, right? That's personal. Grace and peace to who? You. Grace and peace. That's personal. It's it's for us. John starts out the book of Revelation with much the same idea. Grace and peace to you. From him which is and which was and which is, a, is to come. Every letter of Paul except the book of Hebrews starts with his salutation. Grace and peace be to you and slightly varied in John and Peter. This, this was huge in the first century church. Yet, this is not a mere form of speech. It's not repetitious fluff. This is the word of God to us. This is the word of truth to us. That's how God is. Grace and peace to you. Oft repeated as it is, gives full assurance of his favor. And we might call this unmerited favor. Given to us without cause of anything that we did. Because this all happened and made possible before we were ever born, right? Peace and everlasting held forth for the earth. There is no true peace apart from him. I wonder if anybody here this morning with fear. Um, you know, we've been through a lot here the last year, haven't we? There's a lot of fear and a lot of hearts. And uh, any of us who have that. But peace is abundantly available to each one of us. There's no true peace for unbelievers. The Bible says that the wicked are like a what? A restless sea, like a restless sea. How many of you have been down to the ocean and seen a restless sea in a storm? Uh, up there in Oregon, there's a place where the, where the breakers come in and, and uh, you know, there's a water spout as a result of that. It takes a pretty good storm to do that, but it, I've been there at that time. And, wow, you look out at that ocean, you'd say, wow, I would, I'm sure glad I'm not out there, right? Um, troubled sea, they cannot rest. One fearful crisis after another comes. Why do unbelievers not have peace? Let's look at a couple of passages, one from Colossians chapter 1, just a few pages to the right from where we were, Colossians chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, Colossians chapter 1, 20 and 21, and having made peace through, his, through the blood of his cross, by him he reconciled all things to himself. By him I say, whether there be things in earth or things in heaven, and you, that were sometime alienated and enemies, 
in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled. And Ephesians 2, verses 14 and 15, to the left a little bit. Ephesians 2, verses 14 and 15. For he is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, and to make in himself of two one new man, so making peace. Oh, that everyone would believe this. Yes, Let the peace of God rule in your own hearts. Don't refuse it, but let it. Let it have an effect in your mind, in your heart. Jesus bought all the confusion and the enmity with with an awful price that that he paid. We could each one ask ourselves, did he make a good investment for me? When you consider the price that was paid, did he make a good investment for me, for us? He did only if we believe. What must I do to be saved? We could ask the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16. And the response to that question that he made was, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And as you read the passage, Paul and his associate, I believe it was Silas, were ultimately thrown out of town. They came there to bring peace and and help and tidings, good tidings. And they were literally, after the end of the little visit that they had with those people, they were thrown out of town. Simply for preaching the peace of God. Because such a message of peace brought fear to the magistrates and the sergeants. Why would that bring, bring a problem for them? You know, Paul and Silas were in prison, and there was a huge earthquake, and the doors rattled, and the cages rattled, okay? And uh, their, their, their things that bound them were shaken loose from them. And here, Paul and Silas came, they preached the message of peace, and then they were put in jail, and then this terrible thing happened. An angel came down from heaven. You know, they wanted, him to, they wanted them to get out of Dodge, right? fast as they could, and so they literally asked him to leave. Verse 38, unbelievers here who couldn't stand peacemakers. He gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. We all had the same protection every day that Paul and Silas had that night. Every day we can look confidently to heaven and we can have the same protection they had. These sins that he came to take care of are our sins. They belong to us. We're responsible for them. This present evil world resides in the person of ourselves until we see the light of the gospel. Then peace comes. The gospel call is, let Jesus have yourself. Sins and all, which he purchased and which by full right now belong to him. And let us run the race with full assurance. That is the message of the New Testament. In this judgment hour, our sins are to go beforehand into judgment. Where Jesus is our high priest, who will blot them out, no more to be remembered or come into mind. The hour of his judgment has come. What a message for the world. Because this is the final dissolution of the sin problem. And why, why should we not always say amen to that and give him the glory forevermore? That's the message of the first angel. Fear God and give what? Glory to him because he is the one who has done the work. Now Galatians 2.20. I think we could all memorize that. Have that memorized, right? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but what? Christ liveth in me. Galatians 2.20. Blessed here is the result of all of this. We may not catch on first reading just what this inspired text really means. I am crucified with Christ. It may be that if we read into this passage what it doesn't say, we would understand what it does say. 
okay? And we'll understand the passage better. It does not say, I want to be crucified with Christ. It doesn't say that. Although that's a great desire, but that's not the, that's not the ultimate thing, is it? Or it does not say, I wish I were crucified with Christ, that he might live in me. But rather, I am crucified with Christ. This was Paul's personal experience. But it needs to be more personal to us than merely leave it there with Paul. Every soul in the world can say, yes, Lord, I am crucified with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. It's but the acceptance of a fact. It's a fact that Christ was crucified and, uh, and was and is, past tense. For me, it's present tense. And when he was crucified, when he was crucified, we were all crucified with him. Yes, Lord, I am crucified with Christ. And when I hear the gospel, I can say, death to self is the result. I'd like to have us look at a passage in Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. This is a, a passage that we often read when we, when we have a baptism. And we're going to have a baptism here one of these days fairly soon. But Romans chapter 6, verses 2 to 6. Notice what it says. <clears throat> Maybe I'll start with verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any more therein? Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his what? Death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we are planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man, what is our old man? That sinful nature, right? That our old man is crucified with him. How can that be? Is, that's present tense, right? That the body of sin might be destroyed, that hereafter we should not serve sin. That's where the cross led, led Jesus to. He led, it, led him to a place where he died. Matthew 1, 21 talks about, well, let's read it. Matthew 1, verse 23. Matthew 1, verse 23. Gabriel is talking to Mary. Matthew 1, verse 23. It says, <clears throat> Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name what? Emmanuel, which means interpreted God with us. One of the finest passages I know of that, God, that Jesus is God, right? When Jesus came here, he was fully God, right? In him dwelleth all the fullness of of the Godhead bodily. It is God with us, that's his name. So what happened 2,000 years ago is present reality for us. That text said is. And Paul wrote that probably 60 AD, something like that. He said it is. He's the lamb slain from when? The foundation of the world, every generation of people for 60 centuries has had the privilege of having that benefit. And it was done one time, one time and one place on the behalf of the whole world of sinners. God with us indeed. It's no longer only Paul, but all of us can have that blessing of grace and peace that passes all understanding. You know what? We can't reason this out. It doesn't compute. We just ask the Holy Spirit each day to plant faith in our hearts. The Jews entered not in because of what? Unbelief. They wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years uh, like the troubled sea. They were there because they didn't believe the simple gospel that they had been taught. Our text, one more text, and I've shortened my sermon a little bit this morning. It's Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 10. This is 
one of my favorite passages, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. Sometimes people don't read far enough. Maybe read verses 8 and 9, but, chapter, but verse 6 is, 8 is very, very important to this passage. Here's what it says. Verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the what? Gift. gift. Do we all know what a gift is? If somebody gives me a gift and I reach in my pocket and say, I need to pay you for that, is it any longer a gift? It's a gift. Not of works, lest any man boast. But notice, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to what? To good works. Not saved by works, but we're created in Christ Jesus to good works, right? We're saved from something to something. From something to something. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Here's the word grace again. The word faith again. Do you know that faith and belief are interchangeable? They mean the same thing. Putting our trust and our faith in God. Uh, we really can't put that kind of trust in someone unless we know that person, right? And so we need a personal experience with Jesus every day. In the morning when you get up, give yourself to Jesus. Make that your very first work. And the day will go so much better. And while you're doing that, pray for the Holy Spirit to bring faith and trust in your heart and belief. It's not by our performance, but by his mercy he saves us to good works. And I suppose we should ask ourselves the question, could not, could not we respond to all of this with thankful hearts, with believing hearts? Beautiful words to sinners who are unworthy, yet responsive. The world still waits to hear the clearest message of the gospel to the world. The world still waits to hear it. Um, Pentecost is still with us. What happened on Pentecost was, on the day of Pentecost, was truly more remarkable. In that city, 3,000 people were baptized that day. I don't know how they facilitated that. I can't imagine even where they did it. But it happened. It was a miracle of the early rain, the former rain. And that's still with us. So what are we waiting for? Today we celebrate the wondrous grace of love and mercy and peace. Jesus took the justice part, right? The cross, he paid the penalty for a whole world of sinners, 60 centuries of them. And all the wickedness that's involved with all of that, he takes the guilt of all those people. Sometimes I have felt guilty. And I can't wait to go, go to the Lord or go to some person, right? But he took all the guilt, the accumulated guilt of the universe upon himself. For all who truly believe this is reality. See him there taking a towel and a basin and washing the disciples' feet. Wow, these disciples had been quarreling. They're looking at each other, kind of wondering, well, you know, somebody should have provided a person with some water and so forth to do this work. Jesus just looks at them for a little bit. Then he takes a towel and a basin and begins to wash their feet. I wonder what that did to their hearts. It must have, you know, it, it must have had an effect upon them. Part of remembering and understanding such character is in performing the symbol. Today we're going to perform the symbol. Uh, Jesus said to do these things. So we remember him. It's not a work. It's not a walk. We don't gain merit by doing this, but in performing the symbol of foot washing, what happens? We remember something. We remember what he did for all of us, right? Because he humbled himself to even the death of the cross. Let's read about this. It's only mentioned in John. Uh, it's in John, 
the 13th chapter. I never tire of reading this passage. John chapter 13. Um, and if you have a desire of ages, I would suggest this might be a great Sabbath afternoon read. Um, but uh, John chapter 13, starting with verse 13. It says, ye call me master and Lord, you say wealth, for so I am. Verse 14, I, if I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, you also ought to do what? Wash another one, one another's feet. And verses 15 and 16. For I have given you an example that ye should do what I have done to you. That's the second time he suggests this to us, right? The second time. Now verse 16. Verily, verily, I say to you, the servant is not greater than the Lord, neither he that is sent greater he, than he that sent, that sent him. And verse 17 says, if you know these things, what does it say next? Happy are you if you do them. Wow, what an idea. Here is our, here is our, uh, our commission for what we're going to do today. Three times he asks us to wash one another's feet. It's a sign that we say, yes, Lord, like Peter, wash me everywhere. That's really what it means, right? He got, the, he got it right. After the Lord gave him a, a little bit of uh, uh, kind of a gentle rebuke. At the wedding at Cana, you remember the story concerning the water pots. Mary apparently was in charge of taking care of the drinks for that wedding. Maybe these people were relatives of hers. We don't know for sure, but there they were, and they'd run out of, run out of drink, and Mary was frustrated. And Jesus is there, and he, she says, Jesus, can you do something about this? And uh, he must have given her a nod. And so she turns to the servants and she says to the servants, whatever he tells you to do, what? Do it. That goes for a whole lot of things, right? Those good works that we perform are the fruit of our faith. Put your faith and trust in him. Spend some time, some quality time every day with the word. Let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart as you read these wonderful words, and you'll be well rewarded. So, uh, Jesus, help us remember his goodness, his grace, and whatever he asks us to do. You know, faith really is an action word. It says in Hebrews 11, by faith, Noah, build an ark, right? By faith, Noah, build an ark. There's another passage in the Bible that says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. We remember Jesus by the communion service and the foot washing, but remembering the Sabbath to keep it holy. So we won't what? We won't forget him. This is why we have communion service. Uh, you know, it's been probably a year since we've had communion in this church. Uh, that's a long time, isn't it? Hopefully during this period of time we have been remembering him, but today we have an opportunity to remember, remember again the wonderful thing that he, that he has done for us and not forget it. Two things here to remember. Remember his passionate love for us when he came to this world and remember the Sabbath to keep it holy so that we remember that he is our God. And the bread and the wine. That is a symbol of the price of our salvation. Fixed again in our minds. Love so abounding. Love so divine. Calls forth all our reverence and awe of him who loved us and gave himself for us. Amen and amen.